this afternoon. So last time we were trying to solve this equation, right? <coughs> uh, u0 is 0, u1 plus um, u prime at 1 is um, 0. So this is axis from 0 to 1. <coughs> Right? <clears throat> so this is the equation that we were trying to solve last time. Um, so last time we, uh, we said that f of x uh, is minus 1 L of u will be uh, u second um, b1 of u will be u at 0, b2 of u at 1 will be u1 plus u prime at 1. Right. <clears throat> uh, so in the previous uh, lecture, we know that okay, this is the equation that we need to solve. Um, the equation is u second is minus one. So minus one is the function f. Uh, the operator is the uh, the, uh, the Laplace operator, which is the second derivative of u. Um, we have a two-boundary condition: u one of u is u, right, and b two of u is u plus u prime, right? So last time you were confused about uh, the b1 and b2. So to, to remember you, b1 and b2, you, you can forget about the, the points, right? So you can just have to remember that b1 of u is, is the operator. You forget the, about the 0 and 1. So, so the operator b1 acting on u, on u will give u, and b2 of u will be u plus u prime, right? Then, <clears throat> then b1 of u at the point 0 will be u0, and b2 of u at the point 1 will be u1 uh, plus u prime at 1. It's clear? So, understanding b1 and b2 this way, then you can, you can understand the, uh, the eigenvalue problem. So the eigenvalue problem will be Um, L of Pn is lambda and Pn, B1 of Pn at the point 1 will be uh, 0, uh, 0, at the point 0 will be 0, B2 of Pn of 1 will be also 0, right? <coughs> so if you understand that B1 is u and B2 is u plus u prime, then you can write the boundary condition for now for the bar, uh, for eigenvalue problem, right? So in this case, b1 of p will be pn. So b1 of pn at the point 0 will be pn of 0. <coughs> b2 of pn will be pn plus pn prime. So pn, b, b2 of pn at the point 1 will be pn of 1 plus Pn prime of one. Is it good? Questions? It's clear? I explain again. Last time we were now uh, trying to solve this boundary value problem. Uh, you have u second is minus one and x is second from zero to one. You have two boundary conditions. B1 at uh, u zero is zero, u at one plus u prime at one uh, is zero. Right? So to understand um, the, the parameters, we're gonna see that okay, the fork, the fox will be minus one. The operator L of u will be u prime, u second, right? B one of u will be u, and B two of u will be u plus u prime. This is B one and B two are two action that um, whose when you, you take these two operator acting on u, you're gonna get a, a function u, right? So then if you put a a, a point there b1 of u at 0 will be u0, b2 of u1 will be u1 plus u prime at 1. It's clear? Now, the next step is to write down the eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalue problem will be L of <coughs> Cn is lambda n plus Vn, right? Uh, uh, so, so in this case, uh, the L will be, the L of Vn will be Vn second, all right? So the L, the b, one and B2, they're the same. The same kind of thing, 
right? Um, and V1, Vn, V0 is 0, V2, V1, uh, Vn1 is 0. So V1 of Vn is Vn, right? Because of this. Vn of u is u, which means that v, V1 of uh, any function, right? V will be V, V1 of uh, exponential of x will be exponential of x, right? So, so the V1 of Vn is Vn. So, so you, you act this operator on u, you get u. You act this operator on any uh, function, you get exactly that function. So V1 of Vn is Vn, so V1 of Vn0 is Vn of 0. V2 uh, of Vn is Vn plus Vn prime. So V2 um, of Vn at 1 will be Vn at 1 plus Vn prime at 1. And those two things are 0 because of this. Now you get the, uh, the uh, operator uh, the eigenvalue problem. So lambda n prime is lambda n phi n, um, phi n at zero for all x. So this is x, this is x. So x for x is zero and one. Phi n at zero is zero. Phi n prime at one. Uh, phi n at one plus phi n prime at one will also be zero. This is the eigenvalue problem that you want to solve, right? And again, I remind you that, okay, the solution for this one will be sinus and cosinus with a different factor. Uh, sphere, questions? So, again, to solve a boundary value problem, what you need to do is that you need to solve the associated eigenvalue problem. First, um, so let us try to solve this problem, right? So you have Vn second is lambda n Vn. So the characteristic equation will be x squared is equal to lambda n. Right? So case number one, uh, lambda n is positive. So when lambda n is positive, how many roots do you have? Yes? We have two roots. What are they? Square root of lambda n. Can you sign the back of the paper, please? So when lambda n is, uh, is positive, you're going to have two solutions, right? So x1 will be the square root of lambda n, and x2 will be minus the square root of lambda n. Uh, then Pn has to be of the form C1 e to the square root of lambda nt plus C2 e to the square root minus square root of lambda nx. Sorry. All right. What is the next step? Yes. So we uh, start plugging in the boundaries. Yes. Can you sign the back paper, please? So now you're gonna use the boundary condition, right? So the boundary condition will be uh, phi n at zero is equal to zero, which means that c1 e to the square root of lambda n times zero plus c2 e to the square root of lambda n times zero is zero, which means that c1 plus c2 is zero, so c2 is minus c1. So, so C2 is minus C1, then Vn of x will be uh, C1 e to the square root of lambda n x minus C1 e to the square root of lambda n x. Thank you. Uh, the first step, you use the first boundary condition, right? Vn of 0 is 0. Uh, when you plug the first boundary condition here, you're gonna get C1 exponential of this guy, plus C2 exponential of this guy is zero. So exponential of zero is one, and exponential of zero here is also one. So I'm gonna get C1 plus C2 is zero, which means that C2 is minus C1, all right? I replace C2 by minus C1 here, 
I get C1 exponential of square root lambda and x minus C1 exponential of square root lambda and x. Questions? Wait, why is it not negative? Thank you. Can you sign the back of the paper, please? Uh, what is the next step? You're gonna use the uh, the second boundary. Can you sign up the uh, back of the, the back of the paper? So now, so now we're gonna use the second uh, boundary condition. To use the second boundary condition, I'm gonna take the derivative of this guy. So this gives me c1 exponential uh, lambda n expon uh, 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 square root lambda n square root lambda n x minus. So this become a plus square root lambda n exponential of minus square root lambda n x. All right. The next step is to use the second boundary condition. The second boundary condition has a derivative. This is why here I need a derivative, right? I have pn of x is c1 exponential of square root of lambda n x minus c1 exponential of minus square root of lambda n x. When I take the derivative, I get c1 square root of lambda n exponential of square root of lambda n x plus c1 square root of lambda n exponential of square root of lambda n x, right? Here I have a minus, here I have a minus, this one right here, there's no minus. Um, now I, I get um, Pn of 1 plus Pn prime at 1 is 0. Um, so this gives me C1 exponential of square root of lambda n times 1 minus C1 exponential of square root of lambda n times 1. Uh, so because times 1 is... Uh, is not important, so I'm gonna like, re remove it. So I have C2 square root of lambda n exponential square root of lambda n plus C1 square root of lambda n exponential of square root of lambda n. This is equal to zero. All right? So what can I say about this guy? Uh, well, those two would um, cancel the plus and the minus of C1. Uh, oh, no, never no, mind. Yes. Yes. You can fold c1 out and then have e to the square root of lambda n minus e to the negative square root of lambda n times one plus square root of lambda n. Yes. Can you say it back? Yes. Now I got. I'm gonna put all of the. I, I'm gonna put all of the c1 <coughs> as a common factor, right? So c1 exponential of square root of lambda n minus square root exponential of minus square root of lambda n plus exponential of square root of lambda n times square root of lambda n plus square root of lambda n exponential of square root of lambda n and this is zero, right? Now I've put C1 outside. I have C1 times this whole thing is zero. What can I say? C1 is zero. C1 is zero, right? Can you say it uh, back very purpose? Right? So from this, I can say that C1 is 0. Uh, questions. What if this is 0? It cannot happen. Why? Yes? Because exponentially, exponential of lambda square root n is the same lambda strictly positive in the case of the Can you stand back the paper, please? So this is because the, the, the guy inside is strictly positive, right? So if you have what you have square root of square root of lambda n and minus strictly positive. Uh, why? Yes. I have a quick question. Um, would it be possible for lambda n to be one, and therefore, never mind. I answer my own question. Mind. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to uh, answer your questions, <coughs> right? Why <coughs> this is strictly positive? going to be subtracted by its inverse, which would be less than it, so it would still be positive. Um, not very clear. 
So if you if let's say lambda n was one, then you would have e raised to the one minus e raised to the negative one, which would be e minus one over e, which would still be positive. Right. Can you have a? This is a good idea. Can you send my paper? But can you? Can anyone have a better uh, idea of what is going on here? I mean, this is a good idea. This is almost true. This is true, but it's not very clear. Why this is strictly positive? Yes? So exponential minus square root of lambda n is one over exponential square root of lambda n, right? And I want this to be bigger than this. Why? Yes? What can you say about exponential? Exponential square root of lambda n is bigger than what? If it's greater than zero, then it's always going to be positive. So if you're subtracting a fraction from a positive number, then it's always going to be greater than zero. No, because this is positive, so to subtract a positive thing, it could be negative, right? Yes? Um, as the lambda n increases, the entire exponential increases and has the denominator of if I put it to be like, I mean, if I attack Slam and not to be increasing. Right. But this is more of a question. But is it like because like either the square root lambda is approaching infinity faster than uh, No, no, I don't, I don't want a synthetic stuff. I want a precise stuff. Yes? Can it, like, can it never be zero? Because it's like, it's always like either it's coming negative or positive, it's always approaching zero, but it will never like actually reach it. And it's better, it's just very simple. <laughs> yes? Uh, well, e to the root lambda n, 1 over e to the root lambda n cannot be greater than e to the root lambda n. So right. that's, because that's a reciprocal. Why it cannot be greater? Yes? Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. it's 1 over. Ooh. Why is 1 over then this cannot be greater? Yes? The, the lowest an exponent of e can, can make it is 1. So you would still have, uh, so and that's only if lambda n was 0. So anything of, uh, that lambda n could be greater than 0, e to the square root of lambda n will always still be greater than 1 over Excellent. itself. Can you stand the micro please? The, 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 the answer is that this is only greater than 1. Right? Because lambda n is positive. So exponential of a positive guy is on, always greater than one, <coughs> right? And because this is greater than one, one over e square root lambda n is smaller than one. And this is the reason. So the first term is always strictly positive. Uh, basically, this is strictly positive because lambda n is strictly positive, right? It's clear? So the first guy is always bigger than one. And the second guy is, is the inverse of a, uh, a number which is bigger than one, so it's smaller than one, right? So this is why the difference is always positive, okay? So, so this is positive, right? And this is, of course, positive. So the sum inside is always positive. Right? So which means that square root of lambda n, that square root of lambda n, plus, uh, Exponential square root of lambda n, square root of lambda n, plus square root of lambda n, exponential of minus square root of lambda n, is equal to zero, right? 
So you have C1 times a term is equal to zero. This term is strictly positive, so C1 has to be zero. So exponential of positive number has to be bigger than one. So because this guy is bigger than one, the reverse of this guy has to be smaller than one. Right? It's like you have two minus one half. Two minus one half is it has to be positive because this is bigger than one and this is smaller than one. Other questions? So so from here you, you infer that C1 is zero. So if C1 is zero, what can I say about Pn? Yes, can you sign back the place of this? So because C1 is zero, Pn is zero. Fine. So uh, zero is not an eigen function. Right. So we <coughs> in general, if you consider three cases, the first case will not give you anything. Uh, because it always gives you zero. The second case might give you a constant, and the last case will give you the sinus or the cosinus with the factor. All right. So in the first case, we don't have anything. Yes. Yeah. Right. So case number two. Lambda n is zero. What happens if lambda n is zero? Yes. Which is so what is the equation for Pn when lambda n is zero? No, no. You, this is the equation, right? What happened when lambda n is zero? Pn second is zero. Can you sign back to so when lambda n is zero, p n second is zero, right? This is the equation. So what happens if the second derivative of function is zero? Yes. Yes. Can you sign back plate of this? So p n will be a x plus b, right? <coughs> All right, so why is it? Because when Pn second is zero, um, Pn prime is the antiderivative of zero, it should be a constant, and then B will be the antiderivative of the constant, it should be the x plus B, right? So when lambda n is zero, this equation becomes Pn second is zero, right? Pn second is zero means that Pn, Pn prime is i, Pn prime is i means that Pn is ax plus b. All right. So Pn is ax plus b. Uh, what is the next step? Yes. Can you sign my paper, please? So you wanna have Pn zero to be zero. Pn zero is zero. So which means that a times zero plus b is zero, then b is zero. Then I have a, um, a pn will be a x, right? After you have pn second is zero, pn should be a x plus b. Um, now pn now you have to form a x plus b. You want to use the first boundary condition. Pn is zero is zero. I, I replace x to be zero, I have i times zero plus b is zero, which means that b is zero. So pn is ax. Now, uh, what is the next step? Mm, yes? The second boundary condition, pn1 plus pn prime 1 plus 0. Can you set at the back of this? So, so now you have, uh, you want to use the second boundary um, uh, condition, right? Uh, so, I have i times 1 plus pn prime is a, and this is 0. So a is 0, right? The next step is to use uh, the second boundary condition. 
Second boundary condition is phi n at 1 plus phi n prime at 1 is 0. Phi n is 1 will give you a. Phi n prime at 1 will give you a. You're going to have a plus a is 0, which means that a has to be 0. Um, what can you say about phi n in this case? <coughs> yes? Yes, can you say at the end of the paper, please? So phi n is now 0. So this is not admissible because an, a zero function is not an eigenvalue, uh, or not an eigenfunction. Right? Zero, yes? Uh, for this one, could we also not say that since uh, our, our initial condition shows uh, phi double prime is equal to negative one, then we this case could not be uh, true either because this would prove that phi double prime is zero? Uh, no, then uh, we, we haven't come back to the solution yet. This is the eigenvalue problem, right? right. So the eigenvalue problem that we are trying to solve is phi n second is lambda n phi n. We haven't uh, solved u yet. Right, right, right. but we, we, we assume that u double prime is going to be equal to phi double prime with this eigenvalue function. Uh, uh, and since we have phi double prime is negative one, yes. uh, lambda n being zero would make phi double prime zero, so we can prove that case two is not true. Right. right. Yes, okay. this, is, uh, this is very good. Can you sign back the paper, please? Right. So, yes, so you have this. This is the problem that we want to solve, right? Uh, so, in the first case, you don't have anything. In the second case, you don't have anything. Uh, in general, the first case will not give you anything. The second case, if if you find Pn is 1, and 1 is not a trivial function, right? Then 1 is an uh, one eigen uh, function. But in this case, you get 0. So you don't have anything. Uh, the first case will not give you anything. The second case sometimes can give you 1. And if it gives you 1 here, you have to keep it. Here it is zero, so this is fine that we throw it away. So case number three. Number three, lambda n is negative. So what happens when lambda n is negative? How many roots do we have? So in this case, you have x1 is i square root of lambda, uh, absolute value of lambda n, x2 will be minus i square root of lambda n. What is the form of pn in this case? Yes? Um, like c1 e to the i square root lambda n of t cosine of um, lambda. Can you say it back? So, so then you have, you have phi n of x is c1 cosinus of square root of lambda n x plus c2 of sinus of square root of lambda n x. All right? So this is where you see the sinus and cosinus. In general, for an eigenvalue problem, you always have sinus and cosinus function, but the constant, the factor, will be different, right? So in general. So in general, you're going to have sinus and cosinus like in the Fourier basis, all right? Uh, uh, with the different, with the different lambda, with different, right? So in, in general, you're going to have sinus and cosinus like in the, the Fourier case, except that you change the lambda and the domain, right? So the domain is no longer from minus L to L. Okay. Right. So if 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 you in the exam you solve the eigenvalue problem and you find like uh, x to power four, four, you know that this is not correct, right? right. All 
right? So let us um, continue uh, with this eigenvalue problem. So what is the next step? Yes? Yes, let So you're gonna have the n of zero is zero. This is the boundary, right? You're gonna use the boundary to find C1 and C2. Uh, so phi n at zero will be zero, which means that square root of lambda n, uh, um, C1 cos n of zero, square root of lambda n times zero, plus C2 sin s of square root of lambda n times zero is equal to zero. So what what is the solution of this uh, equation? Yes? C1 equals zero. So, inside, back paper, please. so this guy is zero, and this guy is one, which means that I have C1 is zero, right? Pn will be uh, C2 sine s of the square root of lambda n, x, right? So what is the next step? Yes? Take the derivative and use the second boundary condition. Yes, can you stand the back paper, please? Now, I'm going to take a derivative and I'm going to use the second boundary condition. The derivative of this guy will give me C2 square root of lambda n cosine of square root of lambda n x. All right? It's clear. Yes? Should, should it be what? I said, okay, just add the paper, please. Uh, so I have to take the absolute values. All right. Now, I'm going to use the boundary condition. Pn of 1 plus Pn prime at 1 is 0, which means that C2 sine of square root of lambda n x plus C2 square root of lambda n x cosine of square root of lambda n x is zero, right? Uh, so, uh, so in this case you have phi n at one plus phi n prime at one give is zero. Zero, which means that C2 sine square root of lambda n x plus C2 square root of lambda n cosine square root of lambda n x is zero. So what can we say? Yes? What happened to the negative when we took the derivative? What ne negative? When we took the derivative? The, no, sine s derivative is cosine s and cosine derivative is minus. Oh, I see, I see. Yes? That C2 has to be zero. Uh, this one case is C2 is zero, right? Can you sign it back to paper, please? So now I can now factor our C2, and I'm going to have two cases. All right, so case number one, C2 is zero. If C2 is zero, what happens if C2 is zero? Uh, yes? And phi n is zero. Phi n is zero. And yes. that means phi double prime would be zero. Yes, and? And phi prime? No. What happens if phi n is zero? Oh, then, then we can't, it's not a uh, function. Can you say I'd like to break up so in this case, phi n of x will be c2, right? C2 of this, uh, c2 sinus of this guy. So this is c2 sinus of the square root of lambda n x, and this is zero. So this is not an eigenfunction. Right? Yes? In your two equations down there, since you're plugging in the boundary condition, why didn't you plug in 1 for x? Yes. Can you say at the back? Alright, so here there's a one. Uh, 
Um, so this is zero. C2 so in the first case, if C2 is zero, Tn is zero, you don't have any eigenfunction, right? Because zero is not an eigenfunction. We don't take zero as an eigenfunction. Um, so, so, so which means that sin s of square root of lambda n plus square root of lambda n cosine s of square root of lambda n is equal to zero, right? For this, you don't have explicit form for lambda n, but you know that the n will be will be uh, a lot of you're gonna get a lot of uh, value for p p n. So, so in general, you have square root of lambda n will be two point square root of lambda two will be four by nine one three one eight square root of lambda three. So in this case, uh, this equation also has a series of solutions. But they are not like pi, 2 pi, 3 pi. They have those uh, speci uh, special form. Um, so in the exam, you can say that, OK, lambda n is the solution of this equation. Right? So in the previous case, you know that square root in the previous case. In the previous case, previous um, uh, lambda one is n plus one half pi square. Um, right, lambda two. So in uh, lambda n is minus n plus one half pi squared. In the previous case, you have explicit value for lambda in terms of the pi function. In this case, you don't have, but you know that they're the same. They're, they're, you also have a sequence, right? Um, so in the exam, um, you can say the following. So the sequence, the equation, of uh, theta okay, theta plus theta cosinus of theta is zero has a series of solutions. Um, phi one is two point zero two phi two is four point nine one phi three is seven etc. Right? So then uh, square root of lambda n is Pn. But this is a special equation, yes? How would you find the series though if you're not allowed to just calculate? Uh, so this um, so this equation is proved to have a series of solutions. If you want to find I mean but they, they don't have specific value. So if you want to find those P1, P2, right? You plug it into the computer and you solve. Uh, you plug into MATLAB, you, uh, you enter solve this equation, they're gonna give you this series. They're gonna give you 2.0, 2, 4.91, uh, 7.9, 8, uh, 9, 8, and, and you continue and they, they, they're gonna give you everything. Um, but in the exam, you don't have to find those numbers. So you don't have to give those numbers. In the exam, you can say that this equation has a sequence of solution without saying the explicit uh, values of uh, 2, 0, 2, and everything. And you can just say that, OK, square root of lambda n is phi n. It's phi n, right? So this is a, a special equation, and, and uh, we don't have an explicit formula for, for, for theta n, right? But with the computer, we can. We can list all of them, except that we don't have formula. Yes. Sorry. So what I'm saying is that this equation has no 
explicit solution like in the previous case. There's no um, n plus one half pi. What you can say is that, okay, this, um, this equation is proved to have a series of solution. So, so is this enough to say that, okay, because this is zero, square root of lambda n has to be equal to theta n. And that's it. And if you want to see all of the solution, you go to my lab, you, uh, you put F solve uh, this equation, you, you're gonna see all of the solution, right? But, uh, uh, but in the exam, in the, uh, in the homework, you don't have to do that. You just say that, okay, this equation has a, uh, a series of solution and the square root of lambda n has to be the end. It's clear? Questions? Right, so now square root of lambda n is theta n means that lambda n is minus theta n squared. Right? Why is it? Yes? Yes. Can you say at the back of the paper, please? So because here I have, I have the absolute value, right? Lambda n is negative. So the square root of um, the absolute value of lambda n is theta n means that lambda n is minus theta n squared. Right? So, um, conclusion, phi n x will be c2 sinus of theta n x where theta n is old um, sinus of theta n plus theta n cosinus of theta n is zero, right? And because the constant is not important, so I can draw the constant, I'm gonna get theta n, phi n is sinus of theta n x, all right? Yes? Why is C2 not important? Ah, good questions, why is it not important? Can you say at the back of the paper, please, yes? Uh, last time you said it's a, it's a constant, you just multiply it by the function sine phi and x, it doesn't reach uh, And? Any better idea? Why is it not important? So what is the goal of finding this theta at 15? Yes? Is it not important just because um, sine, if there's no more function, the only thing that constant would be just like amplifier or like change the thing, there would still be the same function, just kind of a scalar? Yes, can you say at the back of the paper, please? So basically, this is what you need. You need to express <coughs> u in terms of a0, <coughs> theta z, phi 0 plus a1, phi 1. Plus a n p n, right? Right? So if you put a constant here, you're gonna have to divide a zero. That's it. Right? So if you you take the sinus theta n, uh, so theta zero doesn't exist. So I'm gonna put uh, a one only. So this is a one um, sinus of theta one x plus a n, a n sinus of theta n x, right? So this, so the goal of this is to write, um, to expand the u in terms of this basis, right? But when you multiply uh, this by a constant c, you have to divide a one by c zero, right? over C2 times C2 sinus of. So if you amplify this, you have to divide by the coefficient. And in the coefficient, you have to carry this uh, constant, but it doesn't change anything. It's clear. Thank you. Uh, 
but this is a very good question, right? So from this, you see that phi n is C2 sine of theta n x, where uh, theta n is a solution of, of this guy, all right? So, so I said that the C2 is not important because the final goal of due to this is to expand the solution on the basis. <coughs> so you're gonna write U S I1 phi1 plus A and phi n because there's no A0 because here you don't have phi uh, 0 um, So, so I replace this by sinus, sinus, sinus. So if I multiply the sinus by C2, I have to divide the constant by C2 and it doesn't change much. Right. So if you amplify the, form, the, the basis, you're going to reduce the, the coefficients. It's the same thing, all right? Any other questions? It's clear? Now, you have a basis already. So the equation is u second is minus one. U zero is zero and u one plus u prime and one is also zero. Alright? Um, now I'm gonna uh, do this expansion, right? I'm gonna do u x will be um, a one sinus of theta one x plus A2 sinus of theta 2x plus again sinus of theta nx. So what is u second? So So those function, right? So those function satisfy this equation, right? And lambda n is minus theta n squared. All right? So when you multiply this, you have a1 lambda n squared, lambda n sinus of uh, lambda 1 sinus, lambda 1 sinus theta 1 plus a2 lambda lambda 2 sinus of theta 2 plus um, a n lambda n sinus of theta n. All right? Questions? But of course, you have to find a 1 and a n, right? a 1 and 2 a n. We have to find a 1, a 2, After you you found a basis, what you do now is to expand this basis on uh, you on this basis, right? Um, you know, and and you you have u second is a one lambda one sine of theta one a two lambda two sine of theta two a n lambda n sine of theta n, and your goal now is to find a one a two a n. Uh, uh, a quick question. When you look into this form, the this form satisfy the two boundary condition. So, if I look into so yeah so so I have this I one theta p one x plus a p n x right. So this is p one. This is p n. My question is that, is it true that u0 is 0? Is it
you say back at the paper, please? So u0 has to be 0, right? Because u of 0 is a1, p1 of 0, plus a n, p n of 0. p1 of 0 is 0 because of the sinus, p n of 0 is also 0. So you have a, a series of 0. So this is 0. You have 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. And this is 0, right? This is because P1 and Pn, they also satisfy the boundary condition. Right? This is because Pn of 0. This is because the boundary condition you have for this equation is that Pn of 0 is 0, and Pn prime at 1 plus Pn. Pn prime at 1 is 0, right? Because the boundary of each Pn is 0. Because Pn of 0 is 0. This is the condition for the eigenvalue problem. This is why when you take the sum, then if you, take, if you consider u0, you got, a, you got a series of, uh, of, of, of 0. And this should be 0. It's okay. Now, second question. Can you have u1 plus u prime 1? Is also zero. Which is the condition that we need here, right? Mm, yes? Uh, again, yes, because we said our original boundary conditions of B1 plus B prime 1 equals to zero, and that when you do the expansion, uh, you don't have your P and P1 to Pn satisfying the same condition. Yes, can you sign the back of the paper, please? This is because U1 will be uh, a1 p1 1 plus a2 p2 1 plus a n p n 1, right? Right? So you, you do an expansion. You see that u1 is a2 a1 p1 a2 p1 uh, a2 p2 1 a n p n 1, right? So what I, I do is I just replace the 1 here, right? And and when you replace u prime at 1, you don't have the same. Right, so now, if I consider derivative, I'm going to have a1, p1, prime at 1, because I replace x with 1, and I have a n, p n, prime at 1. Right, so I take a sum. Uh, then u1 plus u prime at 1 will be a1 p11 plus p1 prime at 1. Right? So I take a sum of this guy, I take a sum of this guy, and I take a sum of this guy. Right? So I have a2 p2 of 1 plus p prime at 1 plus a n pn of 1 plus pn prime of 1, right? But this is 0 because of this boundary condition. So this is 0, this is 0, this is 0, so everything is 0, right? Okay. Which means that because this explains why you need to choose the same boundary condition for pn Right um, with the original problem, because you when, after you do the expansion, p n one because of p n one plus p n prime at one is zero, u one plus u prime at one is also zero. Explain, explain again, because when I solve the eigenvalue problem, I choose the boundary condition p n of one plus p n prime at one is zero. Right now, let us consider p1 u1 uh, plus u prime at one. U1 is this guy. Okay. You just replace one into the expansion. U prime, uh, you're gonna replace one also in the expansion, and you add them up. U plus u prime at one. So when you add u and u prime at one, you see that okay, you can add p1 and p prime one at one. So you have a1 p1 <coughs> one at one plus p1 prime at one. This is zero because of this condition. This is also zero. This is also zero. This means that when you add them up, they're all zero. Right? It's clear? 
All right. Now, which means that if you write the equation in this form, the boundary conditions are satisfying because of the eigenvalue property. It's good. Questions? Now, I have to find a1 and an. Um, how do I find a1 and an? Yes? Uh, uh, but you don't have u prime second, right? Oh, isn't u prime second just equal to negative one? Yes, can you send back the paper, please? Right? So w what you do now is you expand minus one to be b1, um, sign as of theta one x, plus B2 sine of theta 2x right, plus Bn sine of theta nx, right? So minus 1 is, this is minus 1. Right? Cool. That's good. And you're going to identify Bn with uh, again, lambda n. Right? So you expand minus 1, like b1 sinus theta 1x, b2 uh, sinus theta 2x, bn sinus theta nx, and you identify bn with an lambda n. Right? A dif different way of seeing this is that, okay, you have minus 1, because u second is minus 1. Right? <coughs> so you have minus 1 is a1 lambda 1. Sin of theta one x plus a n lambda n sin of theta n x. So a n lambda n is the coefficient of minus one in this expansion. So a, a lambda n a n lambda n has to be equal to b n. Questions? Right. So so now what is how do I compute b n? Yes. Sorry, negative, negative one sine from the of the integral of sine from the x to the x squared. Yes, can you send back the paper, please? So, then we have minus one in the front of this sine of n theta x dividing by sine of theta n x sine of theta n x. Alright? You just mm -hmm. take the inner product of minus one uh, with sine of theta nx, and you divide by sine uh, sin of theta nx, sine of theta nx. It's clear. Questions? Right. So this inner product will give you the integral from 0 to 1 of minus of sine of theta nx dx, dividing by integral from 0 to 1 of sine of theta nx square dx. Alright? So in order to compute Bn, you're gonna inner part of sinus with minus one divide divide by the inner product of sinus n sinus n. Right? So the, the this inner product is the integral from zero to one of minus sinus theta n x dx. This inner product is the integral from zero to one of sinus theta n x squared dx. Right? Now let us compute the first integral. First integral is minus sinus of uh, theta n x dx. So how can I compute that? Yes? Uh, cosine of theta n x divided by uh, theta n. Yes, can you send at the back of paper, please? Uh, right, so this gives you uh, cosine theta n x divided by theta n. And you take a difference from 0 to 1, all right? So this gives you cosinus theta n 
minus 1 dividing by d theta. <coughs> All right? That's good. So you take the inner product of minus 1 and sinus. Um, the antiderivative of sinus is cosinus. Uh, but you have to divide by factor and you take difference between 0 and 1. Here I, I have cosinus theta n minus 1 divided by theta n, right? Now, the, the next term will be uh, sinus of theta n x square dx. How can I compute this guy? Yes? Um, we would need to change it to 1 minus cosine 2 um, theta n x over 2. Yes. Can you sign the back of paper, please? So here, the sine square will be 1 minus cosine of 2 times theta n x divided by 2 dx. So how can I compute this integral? Yes? So I'm going to split it into two. The integral from this one of one half dx minus one half integral from zero to one cosine of two theta nx dx. Uh, for the first one, how much is it? First one is x over two, and take difference, and this give you one half. For the second one, how can I compute it? Yes? It's just, I mean, it's going to be sine, so it's going to go to the sine of 1 or 2 theta n x, or 1 and then 0 and 0. 0 is 0, the 1 yeah. is, is yeah. not. Can you sign it back to the paper, please? So this, you're going to get sinus of 2 theta nx divided by 2 theta nx. You have 1 half, different from 0 to 1. The 0 is, is 0, but the 1 is not, so I'm going to keep it. So this gives you 1 half minus 1 over 4 theta n of sinus of 2 theta n. Right? I just leave it there because the, the 1 is not giving you 0. The theta n is not computed uh, explicitly, so I just leave it there. Where's that extra one half coming from? The extra one half, which this one? Yeah. The one half is coming from here. One minus. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is the right. So I compute the integral from zero to one of sine of theta and x squared. So sine squared will be 1 minus cosine of 2 times theta and x over 2. I'm going to split this into 2. So the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 half dx is um, 1 half. The second one is minus 1 half cosine of 2 theta and x dx. So the antiderivative of cosine is sinus. So this is sinus. But I have to divide by two, the factor. Uh, I take different between 0 and 1. And 0 is just 0 because sinus is 0 is 0. But sinus of 2 theta n is not 0. Um, so uh, this gives me sinus 2 theta n over 4 theta n. Questions? Screen. All right, so, um, in, so I'm going to put everything together and get up in Bn. Right? So Bn will be uh, 1 half minus um, sinus of Two theta n over four theta n divided by cosine of theta n minus one. So over the theta. Shouldn't the Should you have that inverted? Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, so can you both send it back to the person who said that? Okay. Can you both send? So this is uh, cosine of theta n minus 1 over theta n. 1 half minus 1 
Jess and Nessa. Suki Dan. We were in bed for Tuesday. Alright, so this gives me cosinus of theta n minus 1 over theta n uh, dividing by for theta n uh, 2 theta n minus sinus of 2 theta n dividing by 4 theta n Alright, and this gives me 4 times cosinus of theta n minus 1 divided by 2 theta n minus sin of 2 theta n. Alright, questions? I'm going to divide the, the cosine of theta n minus 1 over theta n, um, 1 half minus sin of 2 theta n over 4 theta n. So this I write it like 2 theta n minus sin of 2 theta n over 4 theta n. So I, I divide this by this and I'm going to multiply everything by 4. Questions? Now, this is Bn, so what is An? Anyone else? Yes? Yes, can you say it at the back of the office? So, An will be Bn over lambda n. Can I, uh, so what is lambda n in terms of theta? Yes? Maybe it's um, greater than Yes, can you sign back of paper, please? So, uh, BN, uh, lambda n will be minus theta n square. So, this gives me uh, minus 4 over theta n square times cosine of theta n minus 1 over 2 theta n minus sine of 2 theta n. After that, because you have the uh, uh, A and uh, uh, you have the solution. Any questions? It's clear. <coughs> so in this case, theta n is not explicit because you cannot compute the solution of the other equation explicitly. But in general, you know that they they exist. Questions? All right. So uh, there's no questions. Let us go to another example, which is uh, easy. Yes. Uh, since we know that the first two cases are not, uh, are not going to give you uh, the eigenfunction. Should we go ahead for each problem of this case? Now we have to do all of the three cases. Okay. Now, the second case sometimes gives you one. So in the second case, um, sometimes you get a function one. So you have to do everything. And this is in one dimension, right? So this is a one dimension problem because x is taken from zero to one. Uh, this is why in the first case, you don't have solution. But if x is taken in in zero times one times zero times one, the first case will give you some solutions, right? So if you go to higher dimension, you have solutions. This is why when you do the first case, you have to to do it so that when you go to higher dimension, you know that okay, there should be something there. You cannot skip it, right? Uh, now let us consider another problem. You ask this. And the same ice. And um, u0 is 0, and ul is also 0. Right? Um, in this case, so let us do second. And x is going from 0 to l. So in this case, um, this is this is uh, two point two point three point five. 
right? So this is the uh, equation that we want to solve. Second derivative of u is minus f for x inside the interval 0 to l. u at 0 is 0, and u at l is also 0. Um, in this case, what is the operator of u? So the f will be minus f. Uh, so what is b one? <coughs> yes. B one b one u is on, always u. Can you say it back in favor, please? Which means that b one u zero will be u zero. Right? What is B2? Yes? Yes? Can you say in the back of the paper, please? So this B2 of U is also U. So B2, U, and L will be U and L. Okay. <coughs> What is the eigenvalue problem that we need in this case? Yes. P n is equal to number n. P n multiplied is equal to P n number n. P n of zero is equal to zero. P n is equal to zero. Excellent. Can you can make a paper, please? So the eigenvalue problem will be L of U P n of P n, right? And B one of P n. And zero is zero. B two of P n of L will be zero. So this gives me P n second lambda n P n, right? The first guys give me P n second is lambda n uh, P n because L is L u is u second, right? Uh, the second guy. So B1 of Pn is Pn. So B1, uh, B1 at, of Pn is Pn because B1, B1 of U is 0. Uh, is U. So this means that you have Pn uh, of 0 is 0. B2 of Pn is Pn because B2 of U is also U. So Pn L is also 0. Right, so finally you have Pn second, it's lambda n Pn, Pn of 0 is 0, is 0. Questions? I'll explain again. Uh, the crucial step is that you have to write out the correct eigen uh, value problem. You need um, L of Pn is lambda n Pn, so the L will be Pn second. You're gonna get Pn second is lambda n Pn. This is the first line. The second one is B1 Pn of zero is zero. You have U zero is zero, which means that B1 of U is U. So you translate here, you have Pn of zero is zero. B2 of Pn, um, L is zero, which means that Pn of L is zero, right? So basically what you do is you replace this by Pn. Okay. This is a complicated language. But what you do is you replace U by Pn to get a new boundary conditions. Okay. Questions? Right. So this is the uh, 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 boundary value problem, uh, uh, eigenvalue problem that you have to solve. How do I solve it? How do I find Pn? Yes? So if you, if you want to find the IA function, you should start solving for certain cases of when the n is expected to be a function. So like, again, solving for like the original cases. Yes, can you stand back for this? So you do exactly like in the previous case. 
You can see the characteristic equation and you can see the three cases, right? Characteristic equation will be six <coughs> square, this is not there. Case number one, lambda n is positive. Um, right? Case number one, x square, uh, so the, the characteristic equation is always x square is lambda n. Uh, uh, case number one, lambda n is strictly positive. What happens when lambda n is uh, strictly positive? Yes? Sorry, um, the, the two x is equal to positive square root of lambda n and negative lambda n. So you're going to have two solutions. First one is square root of lambda n, and the second one is minus square root of lambda n. Right, so you have two rules, square root of lambda n and minus square root of lambda n. What is the uh, form of phi n in this case? So now you're gonna have lambda n x will be c1 exponential square root of lambda n x plus c2 exponential minus square root of lambda n x. All right. Um, so in this case, uh, uh, lambda n is really positive. What you do is you take um, um, x1 times x and you take the exponential. You take x2 times x and you take the exponential. And this is the form of here, right? Next step, what should we do? Yes? Sorry? Right, can you send back the paper, please? So I'm gonna use the boundary condition. Right, so I have phi n of zero is zero which means that C1 exponential square root of lambda n times zero plus C2 exponential minus square root of lambda n times zero is zero. All right, so this is the first boundary condition. Phi n of zero is zero, uh, which means that C1 uh, exponential square root of lambda n times zero plus C2 exp exponential minus square root of lambda n times zero is zero. What can I say about C1 and C2? Yes? Uh, C1 is equal to Yes, can you say and find the paper, please? So in this case, this is 1, so you have C1 plus C2 is 0, so C2 is minus C1. Right? Questions? So because C2 is minus C1, uh, the C2 is minus C1, Pn of x has to be C1. Exponential square root of lambda n x minus c1 exponential minus square root of lambda n x. Right? It's clear. Now, what should I do next? Yes? Can you sign the back of paper, please? I'm going to use the second boundary condition. Pn of L is 0. So, which means that you have 0 is C1 exponential square root of lambda n L minus C1 exponential minus square root of lambda n L. All right? Uh, what can I say in this case? Yes? Yes, can you sign the black paper, please? So here, I put C1 to be a common factor. And C1 has to be zero, why? Yes? Um, because we said that the first term has to be greater than one, and the second one has to be less than one, so it will never be. Right, so because this guy is weaker than one, and this guy is smaller than one, so this is strictly positive which means that C1 is zero, right? Because C1 is zero, the function is zero, and this is not an eigenfunction. function. So we don't take it. 
questions? The first case is always um, uh, trivial and you don't have to uh, do much. We're going to continue on Tuesday. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.